data which are required for the service that you are providing. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, team of taxmen, please, uh, the next slide. Uh, the concept of consent. Uh, now, consent, again, is something which in uh, India is quite alien. Now, why do I say that? In medical laws, we have had the concept of informed consent for years now. Now, how many times have you gone to a hospital, let's say even for a surgery, and a genuinely informed consent is given? So I'll give you an example. Now, ideally, when you enter a hospital, when we are talking of informed consent, what should happen? You should be informed about your disease. You should be informed about all the repercussions of your disease or any other kind of symptoms that you may be having. You have to be informed about what is the medication. You need to be informed of all the side effects of that medication. You need to be informed of every eventuality that can happen. Same thing for a surgery. When you're entering surgery, you need to be informed of what is the surgery, the risks to the surgery, every single outcome possible in the surgery, every single side effect, every single uh, risk that is there in the surgery. And post that, you make an informed consent about whether or not you wish to proceed with the particular medical treatment or surgery. So in India, again, if you see, till date, you would never have seen the actual implementation of this kind of informed consent. Now, the Data Protection Act actually is going ahead to legitimize this concept of informed consent for data, wherein an organization before processing any individual's data has to issue them a notice. What is this notice now? The notice is primarily going to contain what data of a data subject is going to be processed. So who is a data subject today? Any individual, whether he's an employee, whether he is a person who is being provided a service, anything whose data has been collected is a data subject. So this data subject has to be given a notice informing that, you know, we are processing your data for this purpose. The purpose has to be the purpose for which he has approached you. You cannot process his data for anything else random. Next point, it has to be in a language that is understood by him. So in English and uh, all the lang Indian languages as per the eighth schedu uh, schedule of the constitution, he has to be informed of all his rights over there. We will see what those rights are further. Apart from that, he also has to be informed about where he can complain. So let's say he is having a grievance with you as a data processor, how he can complain to the data protection board. That entire process with links has to be provided to him. Thereafter comes the concept after this entire notice is provided. Again, one more thing that's important is who are the data processors? That also has to be mentioned transparently to him. And let's say he chooses not to really have his data processed by 10, 15, 20 processors where it is necessary for the service, where it is unnecessary for the service, the bifurcation has to be there. Now, this consent which you obtain of the notice the consent has to be an explicit consent. It cannot be a pre-ticked box. It cannot be a notice of consent which is there in some terms and conditions or some big agreement somewhere in the middle. You have added three, four paragraphs. That's not how it works. It has to be a separate document very clearly outlining what you are seeking con consent for and all the points that I mentioned. It has to be available in all the Indian languages, including English and all the other regional languages as per eighth schedule of the Constitution. Now, once you receive this consent from a data subject, you need to maintain a record of this consent. So let's say tomorrow the data subject withdraws his consent, then you have to inform all the data processors not to process his data. And you have to confirm to the data subject that you know you're not going ahead with processing his data. If he asks you to erase his data, you will have to erase it. You will have to ask every data principal, every data uh, processor also to erase this data. Now the question comes, what about data which was being processed prior to the enactment of this act? So there you had never taken consent. You were still processing the data. What do you do now? Now, as soon as this act is enacted, you have to immediate effect take consent. If the individual is not withdrawing consent, there is a deemed consent wherein he is allowing you to process his data. So, but you need to reach out to him explicitly asking him, do you want a consent or you want to withdraw your consent? If he withdraws his consent, you cannot process his data. So this is something which is very, very important. Now, what are the exceptions to this? Please, let's move to the next slide. Uh, team Taxman, please change the slide. Uh, team Taxman, please change the slide. 
Uh, the previous slide, please. Yes. So when we were talking about the concept of consent, now where is it that there is a deemed consent that is there? So the deemed consent is going to be there where it's for a medical emergency. So let's say your data is there with any government institution and there is a medical emergency in the nation, let's say like the COVID outbreak or a situation of war, a situation threatening national integrity for overall public welfare, it is necessary, then the government is allowed to process your data. And in that situation, they, they don't need to come and take an explicit consent from you. That is an exception out here. Where it is for employee welfare. So wherein any organization for employee welfare, let's say they have taken your consent in order to, uh, uh, you know, as an employee with respect to processing of your data. And where the law mandates for employee welfare, there is certain further processing required. So where the law has to mandate it first, then they do not need to take your explicit consent. Where an organization has to prevent corporate espionage and thereafter is doing certain activities for the same, then explicit consent of employees for their data is not required. So these are the exceptions to consent. Now let's come to the concept of rights of data principles and duties of data principles. So as a data principle or a data subject, data principle, data subject, two synonymous terms, what are the rights that this particular act has accorded to you? The right to access information of your personal data. So you can reach out to any data uh, any data uh, uh, processor or any data uh, uh, controller and check out what is the information being held of yours by them. And they have to comply and inform you what data of yours they are holding, what are they doing with that data, how they are processing the data. Right to correction and erasure of personal data. So that's the right to be forgotten or the right to erasure of data. You have a right to reach out to a data controller and uh, let him know that, you know, I don't want my data processed anymore. Please forget me. Please erase my data. And he has to actually erase it everywhere down uh, the line in his organization to ensure that this particular uh, right of yours is not violated. The right of grievance redress. What is the right of grievance redress? You have a right in case you feel that any of your rights under this act are violated, that you can actually approach the data protection board and uh, seek grievance redress. A uh, right to nominate. Now, in the event, let's say you are no more then what happens to your data? You have the right to nominate somebody who will be responsible to take actions or decide what has to happen about your data, which is existing with any data controller. So the amount of importance given to a data principle in the act is so much that it's not only till your life, it is even after your life that your data should not be misused and your privacy should be maintained. What are the duties of a data principle? He needs to ensure that he is giving proper data, accurate data to a data controller. He needs to ensure he's not impersonating anybody else or taking somebody else's data and, you know, uh, uh, creating a fiasco uh, for the data controller. He has to completely refrain or uh, from, uh, you know, giving incorrect data. If he has given any incorrect data, he has to keep updating the data, ensure that he's giving correct data, updating the data for the data controller so that in, uh, you know, even his rights can be exercised and tomorrow the data controller is not held liable for any inaction of the data principle. Uh, team Taxman, the next slide. Now, what are the duties of a data fiduciary? So a data fiduciary, as I said, the data controller, data fiduciary, again, synonymous terms. What are their duties? They have to ensure the accuracy and the consistency of data. So they have to keep checking with the data principle or the data subject that, you know, is there any change in your data? Is this data accurate? You need to ensure this yourself. They have to have reasonable security safeguards to prevent a data breach. So what is the concept of a personal data breach? We're just going to see further. So they need to have all the requisite safeguards to prevent this. They need to inform the Data Protection Board of India and every affected person in the event of a breach. So personally, they have to ensure they are informing every affected person, including reporting to the board. They must erase as soon as possible data after the purpose has been met. So let's say if you have taken somebody's data to open their bank account, once they have closed the bank account with you, until and unless required by any judicial body or any other relevant law in force, you have to delete their data. Uh, team Taxman, the next slide. Uh, team Taxman, the next slide, please. 
a significant data fiduciary. So as I told you right in the beginning, based on the volume of the data, the risk to the data principles, the security of the state, public order, certain institutes, institutions will be classified or organizations will be classified as significant data fiduciaries. Uh, now, what is the difference between a, a, the a duties of a data fiduciary and a significant data fiduciary? In a significant data fiduciary, it's mandatory to appoint a data protection officer. Apart from that, it is also going to be mandatory to have data audits and a data protection impact assessment a routinely annually happening in the organization, sometimes biannually. Uh, team Taxman, the next slide. What is the role of a data protection officer? Now, he is the person who's going to spearhead the data protection compliances of the organization, whether it may be building the frameworks, he can outsource the building. So ideally, a data protection officer has to have uh, knowledge of cybersecurity, data security, legal knowledge, also organizational knowledge. It's very difficult to get everything into one individual. So normally what tends to happen in an organization is the data protection officer is going to spearhead and oversee the entire operation. There may be a lot of roles in this that would be outsourced and, you know, together as a team or uh, the entire compliance is performed. He has to look into the day to day, uh, uh, you could say, compliance of this act to ensure, that, you know, the consent is accurately done. The frameworks are accurately built, the data protection uh, uh, impact assessment is uh, performed uh, in the organization, which stages it has to be performed, the reporting to the data protection board. He's the one point of contact for the data protection board to contact him and raise issues which are there with respect to the organizational handling of the data. Uh, the next slide, please. Cross-border data transfer. So in um, uh, India, you need to understand a cross-border data transfer. Uh, there are certain rules and guidelines that are going to be implemented. The act itself lays it down that uh, wherein uh, for certain categories of data, a cross-border transfer of data will be disallowed. And for certain categories of data, there may be regulation. So where it is sensitive personal data, like your medical data, financial data, uh, the organizations who are processing or collecting this data will have to, in India, only process the data. They will not be able to transfer the data outside the country, outside of the Indian boundaries. Now, this was the concept of data sovereignty, which was highly debated for the past four or five years when this particular act was being deliberated. So uh, initially, the whole concept was Indian data will be processed only in India. Now, with the current provision of the Act, a certain categories of data will not be allowed to be processed outside the borders of India. And uh, the government via notification will be classifying which are these organizations and categories of data that they cannot process outside. So data centers in India will have to be set up to uh, process this data within India. Uh, the next slide, please. the authorities under the act. So there is a data protection board, which is going to be the umbrella body. They have the powers of uh, 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 a civil court. They have the powers under the CPC. So they can sue or to also uh, pull up organizations for non-compliance or upon complaints which are made by any individual or organization to them. Uh, they will be conducting uh, upon receipt of the complaint an inquiry. Evidence can be led over there and post that penalties imposed. We will see what are the nature of penalties also further. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, the data protection body, let's say you are dissatisfied with what they are uh, proposing to you as penalty. Then you have to approach the appellate body. The appellate body, which is there under this particular act, which will be formed. And uh, apart from that, many times if a complaint is filed with the data protection board, if they feel that the matter can be settled by mediation, then they may allow the parties to appoint a mediator who will then thereafter try an alternative dispute resolution methodology of settlement. Now, the next slide is on penalties. Now, before we come to the concept of penalties, you need to understand the concept of a data breach. Now, what is a personal data breach under the act? It's very important. Uh, the Data Protection Act does not have the concept of intention. So even if you have unintentionally, so wherein there is unauthorized sharing of data, unauthorized transfer of data, unauthorized deletion, alteration, unauthorized, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, you could say, uh, uh, apart from sharing, unauthorized destruction of data, unauthorized uh, usage of data where without taking consent you have used data, then all of these are considered a personal data breach. And this will enable an individual or a data principal whose data has been breached to immediately approach the data protection board to seek redressal. 
Now, what redressals are available? What are the kind of penalties that are there? Let us have a look under this. Uh, wherein uh, there is a, a reasonable security and safeguard which has not been uh, implemented by an organization. So where a reasonable level of data security, cyber security is not there and they are not able to demonstrate it. So this cannot be paper compliance. It has to be demonstrable compliance. So when you're being prosecuted, you need to be able to show that you have had the compliance. So then in that situation wherein an organization is failing to do that and there is a data breach, then uh, 250 crores of penalty up to that. A uh, breach in observing the obligation to give the board or the affected data principal a notice of the data breach. So the breach notification, if that is not done, up to 200 crore rupees penalty. A uh, breach in observance of additional obligation with respect to children. So with respect to children under the act, there is a provision which men mentions verifiable consent, which means where people who are below 18 years of age or having disabilities, um, any individual or any organization which is processing their data has to go about uh, taking verifiable consent from them. They cannot be targeted for advertisements. They cannot be profiled. They cannot be tracked. All of these things have to be there. So just having a tick box consent will not work for them. So either the guardian or the parent has to give a consent and that has to be a proper verifiable consent that a guardian or a parent has given the consent for the child's uh, data to be processed in any fashion. So in the event an organization fails to do this or demonstrate that they have done this, up to 150 crore rupees of uh, penalty is imposed. Uh, now, with respect to the previous point, one thing I forgot to mention to you, where you're talking about a breach notification. Uh, in the event an organization fails to give the breach notification to the individuals who are affected, the data principles affected. So let's say there are 1,000 data principles affected and they give a notice only to 50 data principles. So that entirely gives the right to the balanced data principles to prosecute them and file a case that, you know, this is not a complete breach notification. All the thousand people affected have not been notified about the breach and what action has been taken. So that itself gives them a right to be prosecuted, to prosecute the organization for 200, uh, uh, up to 200 crore rupees, uh, where the breach is with respect to uh, uh, any other provision like adequate consent not being taken, etc., 150 crore rupees up to that. And uh, where observance of the duty, so where the duty of uh, the um, uh, data uh, fiduciary or the data principal, uh, sorry, data fiduciary or the data controller is that he needs to ensure that the data is updated, etc. This kind of duties where they have not performed the penalty up to 10,000 rupees. So if you see the, uh, um, they could say, a graph of penalties. Uh, it, it's just a skyrocketing in the highest, as I told you, uh, compared to any other law in this country. So it's very, very important to take the act seriously, take the compliance seriously and uh, ensure that you're compliant in this. And uh, uh, the main steps for an organization towards compliance over here is going to be please start with a data audit. Understand what data you have. Understand how exactly this data is being uh, uh, utilized in your organization. How is it being processed? How is it being stored? How is it being secured? Uh, the data mapping should happen in the right fashion, following which you should have adequate data access controls. Thereafter comes the concept of consent, consent management. You need to build that in. You need to build a privacy framework in your organization. You need to have uh, develop a team that may be an external outsource team, internal team to ensure data protection compliance. This is an ongoing activity it's not a one-time activity you need to ensure all of this is there you need to have data protection impact assessments constantly happening in your organization whenever you have a new technology a new rollout to the public where you're going to utilize their data a new head of data which you're going to start uh, processing you need to do this entire activity you need to uh, ensure that all their rights are being protected the data principle rights are being protected so uh, as i told you this is going to be an ongoing activity for your organization not a one-time activity and you should asap start taking the steps towards it now with respect to consent management very important that if the person withdraws consent you should have a complete mechanism to be able to down the entire trail ensure that you know his data is not being processed without his consent not a single processor should be able to do that you need to ensure that compliance you need to have contractual control also so which means you will have to relook all your legal documents your employment documents where you're processing data of employees where your vendor documents where you know you're allowing them to process data a lot of these things will have to be relooked at vetted modified to be in compliance with the data protection act 
another major aspect of compliance is that you will need to have a, a mandatory of uh, you know data audits uh, which uh, which i already mentioned you should start with it at the first step to understand where you are but also routine ke the act mandates that you need to annually have the data audits to ensure that you know you are always compliant with the uh, provisions of the law now in order to ensure that there is no unauthorized access to your data so let's say a third party breaches your data and your organization even then you will be held responsible for not having reasonable security practices so in that situation you need to ensure you have adequate cyber security ad adequate data security that you can actually demonstrate to the board that i have taken all the reasonable steps and despite that if this has happened then obviously you know uh, there could be minimalistic cases where data breaches can happen despite every single effort being taken demonstrable effort being taken of cyber security and data security so when you are able to show that then that's the only way you would be able to ensure reduced penalties for any offense or no penalties uh, the next slide please uh with this i come to an end of my session and uh, uh you know you uh, i hope uh, all your questions have been uh, answered and any other further questions that you may have with respect to this matter uh, you can get in touch with me separately also uh, on the e email id is provided and uh, I think we do have some time to address some questions. So uh, the next slide, please, and we can address questions also. Uh, any questions, please? Uh, I think I'll only read it out from uh, the messages over here that have come in. So one of the questions I see is how can individuals ensure whether data fiduciary has really erased his data? so that is exactly what i told you there has to be demonstrable compliance it cannot be just paper compliance so when you are applying to an organization for erasure of data uh, they need to be able to show you and demonstrate to you uh, how they have actually gone about deleting the data at every single level and uh, in the event you feel that there is still a misuse of that data and some third party has the data which should not have happened then you can definitely com complain to the data protection board and uh, there obviously once the complaint is taken up they will be able to uh, you know uh, pull up this organization which will have to actually show how have they deleted your data have they taken all the necessary steps uh, they will have to look at that uh, the next question i see is how can a company or a professional ensure that the data collected prior to the date of implementation of the act is complied with within the purview of the act should they obtain consent again after the act is implemented so this is something i already addressed earlier uh yes you need to take consent again in the event the data subject of principal withdraws his consent you will have to delete the data you cannot process that data uh so it's very important for you to take consent with immediate effect do not delay so whether if you're an organization let's say uh providing professional services out also and you're handling sensitive data you're handling people's personal data please immediately proceed to take a notice uh take their consent and uh, only then process their data uh now data which is public information that data is obviously out of the purview of consent so where it's public information which is available anywhere and everywhere then that's not the kind of data you're looking at over here as uh, what you need to take consent for but data which is specifically personal data uh, you need to take consent for that uh the next question i see is is this applicable to just any entity which collects data as part of selling its products uh, yes it's applicable to any uh organization which is not just collecting data for the selling of its product or services but even your own employee data so wherein you are hiring employees you are collecting their data so any and every personal data it's not just customer data we are talking about we are talking of any and every personal data uh the next question i see is uh, uh just one moment um if a third party uh, see if a third party person is collecting data for me and who is responsible so in the data cons the consent form which i mentioned to you the consent notice uh, the list of all the data processors has to be provided and yes you can verify it also by reaching out to the data processors the data controller to figure out what is happening with your data and if the information that they are providing to you is tallying or not that will give you a fair idea of what's going on with your data uh, should we wait for the rules to be notified on the act uh the rules are only going to be with respect to um, uh, you know what data categorization has to be processed only in india it is only going to be with respect to which organizations will have to constantly keep uh, giving uh, like what we call the significant data fiduciaries but uh, believe me if you are an organization which is dealing with people's aadhar information 
pan information medical health information you have a large volume of data of these individuals especially let's say you're uh, an online platform tracking their data financial information by default you are a significant data fiduciary you don't need rules to be notified right now you are given the time to immediately start the implementation you need to understand compliance is not a one day activity by the time you start your data mapping process you start your data audit you start building the framework for your organization the rules will also come so if you start after the rules i think it would be quite late because by that point of time if you are non compliant you can easily be pulled up for compliance and uh, the penalties can be enforced so considering the magnitude of the penalties i would sincerely advise individuals and organizations to immediately start compliance and as and when the rules are notified you can modify your compliance in accordance uh the next question whether a company should appoint a data protection officer how long the company can keep ex employee details what protection steps can be taken by the company to protect the organization data now yes it is always advisable to appoint a data protection officer in the event you cannot appoint a data protection officer or your budgets are restricted there is a concept of shared shared data protection officer services there is a concept of outsourced data protection officer services which also you can take considering your budget so if you are a medium scale organization you may not really keep somebody full time you can also opt for a, a shared data protection officer service uh which is a much more feasible service more economically uh, it can be uh, for your organization um how long can you keep ex employee data now ex employee data once he leaves your organization ideally you will have to delete it uh now obviously your employment contract will also have to be amended to include the data protection act compliance uh, provisions and uh, only wherein let's say required under pf gratuity act or any other tax laws to that extent you would be able to keep the data the next step uh, the next question are companies uh, required to change their policies and change in the employment agreement yes that's exactly what i said so uh, the implementation of this act uh, or the enactment of this act has already happened so yes you need to with immediate effect start uh, reviewing all your policies your employment agreements your vendor policies you need to immediately take that act in effect so uh, this is very very crucial uh what form uh, we need uh, to inform the customer regarding a data breach that is what we call a breach notification so when you are going to do the compliance of the data protection framework uh, you will also be having the uh, formats built up with respect to a uh, breach notification for informing customer so that exactly is the nature of service that is provided uh, in the compliance part by uh, uh, you know for data protection compliance with the framework also uh, the framework for breach notification is built up the formats for it uh, the methodology for it everything including uh, uh, data disaster management all of this is built up for an organization which you need to mandatorily implement under the act um, i see no other questions out here so with this uh, we come to an end of this session and uh, um, all the very best towards the compliance journey in your organization